Literature Fest. This is organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I'm Samad Khurana, your anchor for this session. The session is a 40 minutes, and the topic for today's session is the ultimate goal and the construction of narratives. I'm very pleased to welcome the speaker of this session, Sir Vikram Sood, a career intelligence officer for 31 years who retired in March 2003 after heading the research and analysis wing. Sir is currently an advisor at the Observer Research Foundation, an independent public policy think tank based in New Delhi. He writes regularly on security, foreign relations, and strategic issues in journals and newspapers. So has also contributed many chapters related to security, China, intelligence, and India's neighborhood to books published in the last few years. He's an author of best-selling books, The Unending Game, written in 2018, and The Ultimate Goal, 2020. We welcome you, sir. Now I shall also introduce Sir Ashutosh Patorkar as the moderator for this session. Sir has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years. Currently working as a professor and dean academics at DIA MSR, he is a corporate trainer and academician and is also an author of the book, Five Elements of Organizational Excellence. It is an honor to welcome you both. Now over to you, Ashutosh, sir. Oh, many thanks, Samar. Samar, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, all uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session of Orange City Literature Festival. Um, a narrative is a way of presenting or understanding a situation or a series of events that reflects and promotes particular viewpoints. And there are five components of a narrative. The character of the characters, the setting, the plot, the conflict, and the resolution. And in the ultimate goal, uh, Mr. Vikram Sood, the former chief of India's external intelligence agency, the research and analysis wing, explains the narrative and how a country's ability to control narratives at home and abroad enhances its strength and position. Thank you, sir, for joining us. It's a great honor to have you here with us and privilege to talk to you. And the platform is yours, sir, for the book. Thank you, Dr. Padulka, for, for your introduction. And thank you, OCLA, for having invited me to this uh, festival. I would have loved to, be, to have been able to come to Nagpur with its now um, three-tiered four, three and four-tiered uh, highways and flyovers, which we don't have anywhere else in the country. However, maybe when things improve, maybe one day we will meet up. Uh, thank you for the introduction. There's something else I wanted to t tell you and those who are listening in. You know, I am one of, I belong to that generation which uh, first went to school when we had barely become independent. In 1949 was the year that I went to school. And Everything, everything in the school, the books, the history books, we actually didn't have any history. Everything was English. We didn't have any Indian history, Indian Indian history. We had uh, in other schools, British Indian history. We didn't even have history in our own school. So while we were politically free, we were still hanging on. We still were dependent on the British, our full, former colonial masters for, for everything. And uh, maybe some of you will remember, we used to, in my time, we used to say that, you know, this product is good because it is English or German. And this this one is no good, it was Japanese. So, you know, you, you that was second rate. And there was nothing Indian. Even the narrative wasn't Indian. It was imported. It was what we were told we were by our colonial masters that we uh, we formed opinions as, as young kids. Um, there was only All India Radio. There was no TV. We had only a couple of a few papers, English papers. My father allowed only one paper at home. It was not fashionable to have two or three, as many of us do now. 
and uh, uh, that's that's that that was in that was information just it was it is so different from what we have now where 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 we where it is an overload that time it wasn't so and we were so accustomed to everything english and even if the weather report in all india radio said fair weather tomorrow we would say ke bbc ne kya kaha hai you know that was the reference point everything if that bbc has said it it is truth if it isn't it is not true it depends so that's how a narrative was built earlier on and we were totally dependent on this and then i went through uh, 62 i was at i was at college when the china war started 65 i was a post graduate 1971 was the war with pakistan and bangladesh was born all this has happened i think before many of you many of the youngsters who are today sitting with us here much before their time i suspect that even 1999 kargil was before their time so the concepts of what i went through what the kid the children of today are going through are different for me a cell phone was a, was a huge novelty in in the late 90s but today every everybody has it's 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 a, it's a part of your hand almost so that's how technology has changed that's when i when i was at college when i was at uh, even even in college we felt that what we were being taught was not what was happening what was being told on bbc or everything was not actually what was happening you, you know the stock picture of india was a beggar a, a cow on the street with perhaps a labels underneath saying hindus worship cows you know poverty and backwardness were the stock shots of india and we used to get annoyed i mean it wasn't so bad things were really we were not uh, we were not up there but we were not down in the dumps either but that is how the image has been created all along and then while i started working then we realized more and more that uh, what nations say what nations do and what nations mean are quite different so you have to you have to be able to read between the lines you have to anticipate what they say and if they're talking about even now you can see it you can you, know, you can feel as dr patuka might be feeling that there is a price war on already with uh, with regard to uh, vaccines they they're pulling one down they're pushing one up so these are all narratives being created that i am better it's kind of an advertisement but in this in state craft it is different state craft means that you know you have the best military on earth you have the best economy on earth you are technologically superior than anybody else but this and then you have the means to control what is being said or done through reuters through uh, afp through cbs through uh, cnn bbc all these channels they they put out things mind you they put out very good stuff quality documentaries they are worth seeing but when it comes to news and opinions there is invariably a slant and and we indians we feel that there is a very strong slant against um, against us and um, so na- building narratives through these media through even arts and culture through books through hollywood with intelligence agency engaged agencies engaged in this surreptitiously at many times uh, they do it after all after 1975 when the americans lost in vietnam the image of the united states as the strongest power on earth has not changed they have not won anything since then but they are still the strongest power they have divided the globe into military zones military commands 
like we divide our own country into military commands, they've divided the globe. They can reach anywhere if they want to. Then what is it that has not worked in their... What, how is it that having lost these wars, not being successful in Afghanistan or Iraq, the image hasn't changed? It's the narrative that has prevented that from changing. And narratives are not built overnight. Narratives are not built uh, by a diktat. Tomorrow onwards, we will say that India is the best country on earth, and everybody will believe it. We have to. That it's a, it's a process. It's generational. It's it's a, a commitment from everybody. Our yah to be we trying to pull down the other side all the time. We're not looking at uh, the big picture. We're not looking at India. We're looking at political power, which is different from being in control and command. So in the game of the global game of com command and control, narratives are one of the most important things in, in achieving that goal. It is not enough to have strong military. It is not enough to have um, best economy. It's not enough to have the best technology. You've got to be able to convince the rest of the world that this country is the best to follow, to be allied with, to be friendly with. We give you democracy, we give you, even though they've, they've always defended um, dictators. In 1971 was an eye-opener when Nixon sent the Seventh Fleet to us, to the Bay of Bengal, to threaten us while we were fighting on behalf of democracy. The Chinese and the Americans were meeting every other day in New York to discuss the war. So that's when you really woke up to say that this is how big powers operate. And that's what I've tried to bring up. My idea is that it is time that we also told Indians the Indian story the Indian way, not imported from outside and say that this is how we are, what we are. We are a, it's it's a we are a civilization. We are we have a, a rich inheritance, a rich uh, heritage, and a, and a long history. So we have to learn from both. Get hold, uh, take pride in our heritage, and learn from our history. There's no point going back. We're not going back anywhere. Because the past is not always uh, beautiful and lovely, and it, it, it has had its ugly moments. So we have to learn from the past and move forward. And unless we learn to do that, we will not achieve what we want to achieve. The world must hear India's story, India's way. I think I'll stop at that, and then we can take, carry on from there and uh, take questions. And yes, whatever. that's it. Absolutely. I mean, what you have said, sir, is precisely that the narrative was not Indian in the earlier stages, and uh, even the image was created. Now, what, has, what we have seen is that the facts are not what they appear to be, but are often what they are perceived to be. And the perception, uh, as you also mentioned, that it takes a long time, maybe sometimes generations as well. So the perception built on narratives become the accepted truth. Today, at least India is not perceived uh, to be a country of snake charmers. Uh, you did mention about the country of beggars, etc., but not considered as a perceived as to be a country of the snake charmers. Yet, a narrative that represents 1.3 billion people must exist and must be known. So, what Indian story, the story of 1.3 billion people, must be heard by the world? You know. Uh... We are a democracy. We are the largest democracy in terms of numbers. The, the democracy is by vote of majority. Now the majority is culturally, religious-wise, Hindu. Hmm. Well, that's the way life is. One man, one vote means that and the ethos of your country is derived from your religion, your language, your ethnicity. And 
basically these things these three things define you who you are so we 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 have been very defensive about this we are you know the moment mr vajpai from the government in 99 and 2000 there was a barrage of criticism oh hindu rashtra hindu raj in india hindu raj in india majoritarian rule etc etc my point is that this same thing has been there in the west but no one says it the way we are criticized the americans fundamentally christian yes so is france so is britain so are all these other countries but they they are not christian republics so why should anyone fear that we will be a hindu republic we are an indian republic which has a majority hindus and this it, and there is also a confusion in our minds that we must all be secular actually it is the state the government which has to be secular by secular i mean equidistant you and i have to be tolerant there is a difference i am i am a good hindu i am a good muslim i am a good sikh but i am tolerant of others the state treats everybody equally not on the basis of religion that is what we should aim for and that is what we should talk about yeah all all religions of the world i would think i think all religions of the world all refugees have found shelter in my country we've never turned them away and could you do that in any other country that is why i i see that there are problems in the in the west with with uh, islamic or muslim refugees and how how they are treating each other so our our narrative uh, is is going to be uh, it is how we portray ourselves it's how we treat ourselves it's how we take a unified stand on many of these things um our, our unfortunately our our our, um, our media and sometimes the intellectual class is not so so um, what's the word uh, I don't look at it the way the way we should be looking at things, and not not look at the way the West looks at us. We look at ourselves the way we look at ourselves, not from not imported ideas. So uh, that's how we have to start, uh, and and narratives cannot be built through a consensus. Over 1.3 billion people, you never get a consensus. Yes. This is not a referendum. This has to come from top down. That this is what we want to be. This is what we want to be seen as. Now let's get our act together, all of us. It cannot be just government driven. It won't work. It'll become uh, propaganda. That's not what we want. We want people to genuinely talk about themselves and be proud of what they're saying. proud of our heritage and the more and i see and i and i and i see that this is beginning to happen more and more of us people are writing about india more books are coming out on india written by indians which is a very uh, good uh, step forward exactly uh, what you have said is absolutely correct i mean uh, the narratives are not neutral or innocent but they are always strategic that we must accept and uh, currently when we see that the world is uh, transiting through its most turbulent period and the future is unfolding in many alarming ways it's driven by the global aspirations of nations economic swings the emergence of new powers unsettled regions rising nationalism and religiosity accompanied by an exponential growth of technology the narrative will have to be strategically correct uh strategically right as you have rightly pointed out that some of these countries though they are predominantly christian or they are predominantly 
uh, divine Christians, uh, they have not given this kind of uh, narrative. So we need to do something uh, strategically right here. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you can call it a strategically right or uh, how should I put it? Um, whether the thing is we have to just make sure that we don't get carried away by what others are saying to us, telling us. They will criticize you. They will say things that you don't want to hear, you don't like to hear. But you have to, in a way, disregard it. And be sure of your own uh, positions, of your own... Uh, um, why be defensive about the whole thing? You know, the, the unfortunate incidents of Gujarat happened in 2002. But nobody talks of Godra. Yes. See, that's the narrative. <laughs> that is that is that is how we've operated. We have allowed ourselves to be operated like that because the West said, "Oh, this has happened. Muslims have been killed." Yes, they've been killed. So were Hindus killed. So were others killed. But how did it start? Nobody wants to talk about it. And we also rarely talk about it. So we should we should have that confidence that we didn't start it. It took us 150 years to solve Ajodhya. Why? Because the Hindu is basically a tolerant person. You Everybody knew that, you know, uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is an article of faith with the Muslims. Bethlehem is an article of faith with Christians. Nobody wants to change that. Nobody destroys that. Nobody disputes it. <laughs> Why here? So, but it, it is us, it is the Indian who has let the constitutional process go on waited for so many years for this to be established. That is our greatness. That is the greatness of the, the, the culture of this country. And I, I would think that uh, that's, what, that's what matters most. That strategically means that you have to look ahead. You have to look at what the situation will be 20, 30 years from now. You have that much lead time to change your narratives you've got to take into account how the situation will be in, on, on the globe um, on, on many issues i mean not related to politics climate change and, and artificial intelligence all these will be new factors that you have to work into your narratives it's not going to be easy and if you don't start now we'll never succeed yeah uh, precisely. <clears throat> I mean, what you have pointed out earlier also is that a building narrative is a participative process. It's not that just one dimensional. And uh, the goals, intentions, and ambitions, they should define the narratives. So the power of praise is far greater now, today. Yep. And the U.S. has relied uh, very heavily on the arts and culture, as you pointed out, that there's a Hollywood narrative every time that's going in. Mm -hmm. And the other two major institutions that have contributed to uh, this particular have been the religion and played a substantial role in a divine Christian nation like United States. So when this narrative building is such a participative uh, exercise, both individually as well as institutionally, uh, what kind of individuals and institutions you expect to play more responsibly in constructive Indian narrative? You know, if you, uh, my, my idea of uh, describing the, how in, in God's own country, for instance, yeah. um, was how they created institutions way back in the 1920s and some later to get talent together. Yeah. Corporate talent, 
anybody who, who could contribute to the thought process together and together they would make america keep america great we we have to think of those terms those situations where we find young and old brains together people who think together for the country and then let them come out with uh, the vision a constant vision a not not a one time story that how it is evolving how they're seeing the world how, how if if you read foreign affairs magazine of the, the council on uh, foreign relations they give you an idea of what america is thinking yes the the cfr is sometimes been called the wall street think tank so you have to have institutions like that one man can do it one three one point three billion people can't do it together it has to be done by groups of influential powerful people who think for the country and and of course uh, there is also the argument that uh, this this group would then uh, uh, only look after itself its its interests after all uh, the american inequality of income is huge yeah, yeah. 10 11 percent own 80 percent and the it's, yeah. and the rest own 10 percent 20 percent so there is a huge uh, income disequal inequality in the country exactly yes more blacks are in prisons than they are in the as a percentage in the country yes so um, there are in it, there are problems um, the corporate uh, the military sector the even even uh, doctor your pharmaceutical sector is in the yes. big big pharma is a is an industry by itself <clears throat> so they, they all have vested interests also well, that's a fact of life Right. And when you're thinking of greatness of the country, you are going to not be sentimental about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you we start being sentimental about it. There's no sentiment in international relations. Only interest. Only interest. National interest. Not yes. national sentiment. Yes. So we have to... We have we have to grow into that. It's it's not we haven't grown into that yet. Yes. We 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 take you know, human rights is 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 a big issue with some countries some of the time. Not always. Hmm. Human rights became a particularly evo evocative subject for the West after the fall of the Soviet Union. Before that, they had all the dictators on their side fighting communism to bring democracy. Mm -hmm. Right? It's it yes. is it is the narrative that you want to bring democracy, but you are supported by dictators who don't want democracy themselves. Correct. So it doesn't matter. It's when they fell, they wanted to have some control on the countries that have suddenly become uh, out of the out of the Soviet group. So human rights became an issue in the 90s as a major um, uh, a instrument in the hands. It's a, it's a slogan. Democracy yeah. is a slogan. There's no international democracy. Democracy is only within a country. Between nations, it's only power. Yes. Global power, dominance. That's the game. <laughs> And uh, many times uh, it has been pointed out that there are no uh, permanent enemies or permanent friends. There are only permanent national interests. Absolutely. And that's what uh, most of the times the heads of the state have said. Uh, yeah. Incidentally, in developing these narratives, as you have also earlier pointed out, Hollywood has been under the scrutiny for its association mm -hmm. and dependence on the U.S. government, notably the Pentagon, CIA and the White House. So it's not surprising because there is a question related to what kind of skills the new people should be acquiring. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising uh, because a medium that captures the imagination of all uh, reaches all households via the big screen or a TV. And now through the other channels like the web streaming, 
services, uh, they have evoked government interest. And it gives a sense of uh, sense that the country is moving in the right direction. So what <clears throat> role Hollywood has played most of the time is that even in the defeats or the messed up operations like Black Hawk Down, uh, yeah. when the US had to abort its Somali operation, uh, but it was shown as a heroic in the Hollywood yeah. adaption of the movie. Or even for that matter, the fictional stories like Guns of Navarro. Uh, it was the heroics uh, or the uh, display of the power of the intelligence. Or even the uh, very, uh, not exactly very latest, but then the new films also like Zero Dark Thirty or Argo. Uh, they were good for the CIA as uh, due to the public support for their activities, the national security state, etc. So the participative exercise is very, very much needed in building this kind of a narrative globally. How do you see the diverse Indian yeah. entertainment industry contributing to this? I see more of this happening now on the TV. Mm -hmm. TV channel serials are uh, devoting more time to it. We are doing more realistic films also. But that's that's a natural kind of, I think it's a natural evolution. It's not state guided. It's not uh, mm -hmm. because the movies that they make, the professional movies so far on espionage and um, stuff like that, the films have been just masala movies. They have no, they have no truth in that. There's no semblance of reality or realism. There's nothing like that. Uh, I mean, who's that fellow? Salman Khan and the Ekta Tiger and all. That's, that's uh, the Indian version of James Bond. James Bond is, is, is also fiction. So we have to, we have, we have been doing. We have been bringing out movies of a different kind now. It's it's happening, but it's also um, many many people say I do I don't know that there is a, there is sometimes a communal angle to it. I'm not sure, but movies like uh, the one on uh, uh, Lakshmi Bai mm. uh, that Lakshmi. that was uh, I believe pretty authentic. There are disputes about. Um, there, there is definitely a uh, kind of um, um, the earlier version that Tipu Sultan was a great, noble, moderate leader has been challenged by new historians with facts and figures and situations. So things, things will be put in the right perspective. Uh, you know, uh, our history has to also evolve in India. Uh, our history seems to end uh, somewhere near Siliguri. East of that, many of us don't know. That has to change. Yes. South Indian history has to be brought up. Yes. That's where that's where the real India was is. The North was overtaken. Yes. So that we have to we have to bring all that out without without running down anybody. What happened in the past has happened. It's okay. We can't change that. But but I have a past too. I must learn from that. And uh, I don't think uh, you know like the, the the Americans were able to put a liaison cia liaison officer in, in hollywood to give them advice instructions they would open their air bases for authenticity mm -hmm. we haven't got to that stage yet and i don't think we will and i don't think we uh, should be in a hurry to do that yep. for the present so we'll have to make do with less but there can be authenticity included in our uh, projections in other ways. So uh, Bollywood is, 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 was pure entertainment, but now it has also become poor entertainment. Yes. A very interesting point that Sir you have brought up is that at many schools post-independence, history is not a subject. At college, only the modern India, that is the British period on independence, and then the medieval India are focused on. 
the ancient India comes poor third. I mean, it's not even a third; it's a poor mm-hmm. third. And that's where, at college, the perceptions and the narratives are strengthened among the young, who would go on to become the new rulers and citizens of this country. Yeah, yeah. So, what's your dream syllabus for these new rulers of India? I think history written by young Indians. for indian consumption not history uh, you know at college books were by um, i don't even remember not smith lane pool and others mm. or history or todd's memoir uh, memoirs about the rajasthan chronicles and all that we didn't have it. you know we had a blank period between the 12th century and the departure of the british now well, that's a long time after nalanda and takshashila were destroyed nothing else was put in its place till the british started putting their universities we had we had informal school and we had informal universities but nothing like that was allowed to be established so uh, we had the um, the british establishing universities and uh, they were doing it for themselves they were not in any case in india as a the red cross volunteer they were here to make money they yes. were here to rule so granted to them we let them do it so uh, we connived at letting them do it so they they made use of it so uh, they gave you particular kind of education yes they did not have the manpower to rule india on their own so they incorporated the amenable india to that task yes they my father was things. working for the british till 15th of august 1947 next day he was looking for the government of india so was my grandfather or grandfathers they were all like that yes so uh, the indian army was the british indian army till 14th of august 15th of august it was the indian army ics was ics working for the british then it was supposed to be working for the indian government you know the flip over was very quick but certain things didn't change in certain things imbibed in their minds of my father or my grandfather were, were there yes But there are so many things they passed it on to me till i started realizing that this is not the correct thing baba yes more there are so many india then then just uh, <laughs> what the british did or told me yeah there are so many things i mean actually i wanted to know from you but we are running completely short of time just one oh. final question from my time, my side and then we will uh, take one question from the audience no. uh, the narrative of harmonious multiculturalism that the european governments hoped of would percolate into the society as well for example in case of france so even the then president um, uh, nicolas sarkozy in a televised debate a few weeks before uh, david cameron's speech had also pronounced the failure of multiculturalism in europe and there was a hope then that possibly the leadership was closing ranks to rethink its policies and india secularism uh, the definition emphasizes on multiculturalism which has failed so what should be the new narrative because that's also a question that what are the key elements of constructing narrative here you know the the uh, the europeans acted in a particular way um, some people say out of a sense of guilt of how they treated the jews so the germans for instance so they became a little relaxed and uh, about immigrants and most of the french immigrants or the german immigrants were muslims or the dutch they didn't realize that they are dealing with a different kind of religion especially the orthodox fundamentalist among them i i begin my i have begun i had begun my chapter 8 with a quotation if you might remember i said 
by means of your democracy yes we shall invade you yeah by um, means, means of, of our, our religion, religion we shall dominate you yeah yeah this is what a muslim priest told in the vatican in october 1999 and the west thought that if we give them everything they will amalgamate they will merge into us no they have they want to build their own system and uh, appeasement never led to desirable results appeasement only created more appeasement so if you are going to treat everybody equal then treat them equally the moment you start giving connections uh, um, handouts or privileges for whatever reason religion language whatever it doesn't work you only have to give in more and that's what's happened in europe now they have to step back and now it's going to be even more difficult yes sir thank you very much it was such an interesting and insightful interaction with you we are completely running short of time uh, but it was really a great insight on how the nations have to build uh, their narratives and how the agencies have to participate in that what role what responsible role these people have to play and where probably we need to correct our path so that's my take away from the session sir thank you thank very you. much thank you it was pleasure. a big big pleasure and also a privilege for me to interact with you and it is back thank to uh, samarth uh, samarth uh, thank you very much for having us here thank you sir thank, thank you so much vikram sir suit sir and dr ashutosh for this amazing and really insightful conversation i'm sure the audience was delighted to witness all of this i also thank the publisher jagannath for all the help and a big thank you to sgr knowledge foundation for organizing this event on behalf of all in city literature festival we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us lastly i thank the audience for attending with us hope everyone has a great day ahead thank you thank you very much thank you thank you all 20 years of existence two universities 23 educational institutes offering 137 courses rai sony group of institutions a vision beyond